I'm on my back porch. What's up? It looks like I'm on my back porch, but I'm actually on the set of my new TV series called Kingdom Business, which I'm doing for BET. Isn't this amazing? See, if you, if I didn't tell you, you'd never know. See, it's interesting, right? Movie and TV magic. Right here, looks like I'm in the back porch. Right there, you see it's all made up. Why is this important? Because see, when I was young, you know, doing uh, Pathfinders and, uh, you know, <laughs> being involved in the after uh, Sabbath programs, at the time it was called AY and all of that, you know, I had dreams that even with our faith that I could make it here in Hollywood. And a lot of people said, oh, you can't be successful in Hollywood. And, you know, it's not going to happen. And here I am producing a major TV series for one of the biggest networks in the world. And earlier this year, I produced a movie for uh, for Disney um, that'll be coming out, which is all about the creation of Flamin' Hot Cheetos. Why do I share all this with you? Because literally, I'm standing in what is the power of faith. This is what faith can do. Nobody believed that this was possible because it, they hadn't seen it. But just because they haven't seen it doesn't mean that God hasn't seen it for you. Really important for you to not allow anyone who has not seen what you've seen to tell you what is and isn't possible. And let me tell you something that all of this, you know, from day one, I started as an intern uh, working for Will Smith when I was 18 years old. And in that internship interview, I told them, I said, listen, uh, I'm happy to take the internship, but I won't do it if it requires me to work on the Sabbath. And they were like, okay, you know, we'll figure it out. And that was when I was 18 years old. 25 years later, I have never worked on a Sabbath. I have made movies in Beijing. I've made movies in London. I've made movies in Canada. I've made movies here in the United States and never worked on the Sabbath. Why? Because I made that my commitment and God has honored it. You do not have to compromise to get any sort of recognition. You can do what God has called you to do, but the key is you have to do it the way he's calling you to do it. You can't do it the way that your mom wants you to do it. You can't do it the way your father wants, your brother, your sister, even your pastor. I dare you to not only dream, but to then go after the dream. Because so often others are trying to dream for you, but you are the only one that can dream. And your dream is valid. And your dream is powerful. And your dream is truthful. Please listen to me. You are not on this earth to become what your parents want you to be. You are on this earth to be who God has already created you to be. Some dreams may put you in direct opposition with the very people you love. But let me tell you this, if you love God and you do what he's called you to do, don't worry, they'll get there eventually. So many people told me, oh, you can't do it. And Hollywood is Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the devil's playground. And you're going to lose your faith. And here I am making content that's uplifting. Hello, all. And welcome back to my channel, Red Femme Diaries. Okay, this one is going to be heavy, hard, thick, and long. Oh, I didn't sound right at all. <laughs> anyway, okay, so I I do what I'm, the things I'm about to talk about right now are so incredibly important. Um, we're going to be talking about life and death and and all these things here, and we're going to talk about the internal battle of a man and the things that he goes through in dealing with his face, his faith. And his lust for the pleasures of this life. So I'm going to try to keep it as simple as I can. A very difficult topic. Okay. So let's just dig right on in. So the video that we just watched. Surface wise. If you just glance, it, glance at it and watch it really quick. It seems like a very uplifting, hopeful, um, good video. Right. And did some of you guys may have you know, even been inspired 
by some of the things that he said but as you guys know on my channel i like to dig a little bit deeper and i hate that i do that but i can't help it y'all i can't help it so as i do this video you might want to rewind and re-listen to some of the things that he says and what i hear I hear a person, a man that was brought up in a very strict religious background. I'm like, I just, I just know I'm a seven day Adventist. And then, but he has this creative mind, you know what I mean? And although he can definitely do things within the church, there's something about the lure, the lure of, of uh, fame and fortune and money and all these things. And so he decided to go into Hollywood. And so he wanted to believe that he could carry his Christian faith into Hollywood and that he could have both. He can prove to those who said that he couldn't do it, that he could. He could keep one foot in the world and one foot in the church. He was for sure that he could do that. But uh, let's just take a look at this and see, was he really able to do it? So um, I heard about uh, Devon Franklin uh, many years ago. Um, he was one of the producers of, of the movie Heaven is for Real. And I had a big problem with that movie. And I'm going to show some clips after this uh, about that particular movie because it uh, created a very false uh, narrative of what life after death is. The, vi the Bible is actually very clear uh, about what happens to us after we die and after this is done I have a Bible study that I did many years ago and I'm going to break down uh, the question are the dead really dead and some of the things I'm saying of uh, many of you probably have never heard this before but I think it's very important because movies like heaven is for real like Mr. Franklin uh, produced and promoted will have the audience believing that heaven is going on right now. They want you to believe that there's heaven going on right now and there's hell going on simultaneously and that as soon as you die, you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go straight to hell. Um, if you really thought about how horrific and horrible that is, um, I don't mind, I don't, I do I don't um, blame people for hating a God that would, you know, burn, that have people burning right now as we're living each day. People just burning for all of eternity. Uh, that's what I was taught about God. And that's what I believed until I found out the truth. But my issue with Devon Franklin, instead of promoting a film that told the truth about heaven and hell and eternal life and life after death and, and sharing the truth of what he knows, because in the video, he says he was a true Adventist and Adventists are very clear about what we believe about uh, what the scripture says um, about uh, the afterlife. He went completely against that. And I'm going to show some clips here that are kind of going to uh, bring that to light. And the reason why I'm saying this is not to condemn this man. I believe in judging. I don't believe in condemning because he has his own personal battle with God. What I want you guys all to do is learn to discern. Okay, it's so important in these times that you guys are in. I'm not going to be with you guys um, for the reason God saw to take me out of here before I see all of this come come to pass. But you guys are here and the delusion, there's scripture in the Bible that talks about the delusion uh, that will be sent. And let me find that for you right now. Hold just a second here. Okay, y'all found it. It's Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse uh, 10 so yeah we, we about to get into scripture a little bit here so you know click off if you can't handle it um so uh second those thessalonians uh, chapter 2 verse 10 uh, it says and with all unrighteousness deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved verse 11 and for this reason god will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. <laughs> I mean, in a lot of my videos, I, I laugh because the truth of this life and this world is right in front of you. If you just believe and accept it, you know what I'm saying? Um, a, a person like, you know, Devon Franklin, I get it. You know what I mean? He's... 
man, the temptation of worldly fame and fortune and all these things as deep. You know? That's deep. But what did Christ say to the rich young ruler? You know? What did he say? Let's just look at it real quick. It's uh, Mark chapter 10. Uh, start at verse 17. I'm just going to read it real quick. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running. Knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Wow, y'all. And you see a man like Devon Franklin, you know, Man's, I think, worth like 10 million. Fame, fortune, and glory. And if he tells this lie about this boy, you know, uh, uh, going into heaven and, 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 you know, coming out. Don't worry, we're going to get there, y'all. I'm going to show you how um, that's just not it. He'd rather tell a lie to you know receive the pleasures of this life and that's what it is but we're going to stop here and the next video that i'm going to show you is this going to be a little bit of information about this story that mr franklin produced um uh heaven is for real and the purpose of this is not to condemn this man because he probably will be sitting on the right hand of god while i probably will bust hell right open but the truth is still the truth regardless uh of what happens to me and so what I want y'all learn, to learn to do is to discern spirits because the delusion will be strong for you guys. You have no idea. So let's take a look at what Mr. Devon Franklin has to say about uh, the movie um, that he produced. We're going to uh, also uh, look at um, some reasons why um, that, that story is not possible. And finally... There's going to be the ending of my Bible study that I did a really long time ago. So this is a very, uh, very long video. So I'll say my ending now, even though it won't end for a while. Please like this video, share this video, and subscribe to my channel. This is Red Film Diaries. Uh, goodbye. P.S. <laughs> Um, I, I did my best to explain this. This it, It's hard to, to break something like this down. I hope that you all grasp it and um, can learn from it. Okay, so here we go. Uh, see you next time. Now, what do we do with this recent batch? And it is a lot of people who profess to be believers and they write about taking trips to the afterlife. All right, what do you do with that? Well, I think you could start by asking the question, uh, well, what exactly is going on with those people? What did they experience? The whole premise behind every single one of these books is contrary to everything God's Word says about heaven. John MacArthur sums it up best. I don't have this quote in your guide, but he points to these two verses. I've got Proverbs 34 and John 3, 13, when he says, For anyone who truly believes the biblical record, it is impossible to resist the conclusion that these modern testimonies, with their relentless self-focus and the relatively scant attention they pay to the glory of God, are simply untrue. They're either figments of the human imagination, dreams, hallucinations, false memories, fantasies, and in the worst cases, deliberate lies, or else they're products of demonic deception. He continues, we know this with absolute certainty because scripture definitively says that people do not go to heaven and come back. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Proverbs 34. Answer. No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. John 3.13. All the accounts of heaven in scripture are visions, not journeys taken by dead people. 
And by the way, you notice that is a theme with all of these books. There's another book. I don't think that he mentioned this one. It's a doctor. I don't think she professed to be a Christian at all. She took a trip to heaven, and now she's writing a book about it. And people gobble it up because it's a book about heaven. These, we can conclude, are extra-biblical accounts. Now, I don't know what happened in each one of their little journeys, but what I can conclude is they are not biblical. I can con So these people, they're believers Whatever is the reason that they're claiming that this happened, they got bonked in the head, it's a hallucination, something demonic. Maybe they're lying, but I can't know that. I trust they're a believer, but I also examine what does the Bible teach about these things? And even visions of heaven are very, very rare in Scripture. You can count them all on one hand. Four biblical authors had visions about heaven and wrote about what they saw. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Paul, and John. All of them were prophetic vision, not near-death experiences. Not one person raised from the dead in the Old Testament or the New Testament ever wrote down what he or she experienced in heaven, including Lazarus, who had a lot of time in a grave for four days. I was reading the other day, 2 Corinthians 12 describes being, Paul being, he describes being caught up into heaven, but he gave no details. He summed it up in three verses. One author said, all the biblical writers who saw heaven and described their visions give comparatively sparse details, but they agree perfectly. Their visions are all fixated on the glory of God, which defines heaven and illuminates everything there. They are overwhelmed, chagrined, petrified, and put to silence by the sheer majesty of God's holiness. Notably missing from all the biblical accounts are the frivolous features and juvenile attractions that seem to dominate every account of heaven currently on the bestseller list. So he gets a little more detailed about the reasons why he lied. He says, I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention. When I made the claims that I did, I had never read the Bible. People have profited from lies and continue to. They should read the Bible, which is enough. The Bible is the only source of truth. Anything written by man cannot be infallible. Okay, well, maybe we should stop asking a 10-year-old kid about spirituality and the answers <laughs> to the universe. Maybe that's what we should be doing. That's what you think because... He's going from one bad idea to another bad idea. He's just a young kid. He's just a young kid. Yeah, no, this time he's got it. He's, he's got, got it. figured it out this the time. The only truth, because the, remember when God, uh, he used fountain pens to write it. I don't know if you remember, he wrote the Bible with fountain pens. Is this that right? Yeah. Who, exactly what she said. These are just people looking for confirmation bias. And uh, who, who fucking believes this kid went to hell? A lot of people. A lot of people. You're right. <laughs>
am I going to see them again? Yeah. You know, is heaven for real? So just yeah. the title, the book, the story is so fascinating. It is, it and is. And your cast is amazing. Yes, Tell yes. us about the casting and how you came up with this amazing oh cast. Oh my goodness, we have a okay. Hey guys, I'm going to jump back in here real quick, but did you catch that? Uh, did you catch that? Basically, what he does here, the host asks a very important question. I mean, isn't this the one question you should be searching for your entire lifetime is essentially what happens after you, you die? Is heaven real? And it's almost like she really wanted to know herself, but she kind of saw that she wasn't going to get anywhere with it. And they kind of dodged that questions to supposed questions that can easily answer that question from scripture. They dodge that and they immediately go into some characters and some actors. This, this stage movie, millions of people have watched. They can answer the eternal question, what the scripture says, but they choose not to. Uh, one more thing before I go, um, do understand that the story that uh, Devon Franklin did of is heaven for real and the one that they were talking about malarkey, those are two different cases. There's been several cases of people going to heaven and also to hell. Uh, sometimes people recant, sometimes they don't. But on this particular this channel, we go by what the word of God says. If you choose not to go by the word of God, then you can pick any one of the millions and billions of stories of the, of the path, the way to get to God that you so choose. But I do believe that we serve a good God and that he did give us a guidebook. He didn't just drop us off here. He gave us a guide to see through uh, the turmoil that is this life. Okay, uh, next will be my Bible study and I will see you guys next time. Okay. Peace and blessings. I am naturally Nyla, and I'm here again with a Bible study. This Bible study is going to be about the state of the dead, and are and are the dead really dead? As some of you may know, um, last year, last August, my father passed away from complications from stage four lung cancer. That was very traumatic for me, and I'm still grieving to this day and I don't know that I'll ever stop grieving. I was very close with my father and when he passed away, although I knew that he was battling that disease for so long, the pain of that um, was almost unbearable and I'm, I'm still dealing with that now. But I still wanted to do this particular Bible study because my sister, Nikki, hi Nikki, <laughs> she has began her own spiritual journey and in that I said that I was going to be doing Bible studies on YouTube and that I would send them to her. I told her that I was going to be doing this one uh, like a couple months ago but just haven't been able to get around to it but I have the most beautiful and patient sister out there and she's just so patient with me and she's just like whenever you you know get it out I'll watch it sis so love you Nikki and here you go this is for you. So um so death, that is a topic that, although you, you hear about it, you, you see it, it's not really talked about in any depth or any detail. Um, and so that's what I wanna do now. I wanna clear up um, misconceptions there are out there about what really and truly happens when you die. When my father passed away, there's so many people that said so many, you know, kind and wonderful things to comfort and console me. Um, and I really appreciated that. But what was difficult was I have a very clear biblical understanding of what happens when you die. And there's a lot of confusion out there about what actually happens. So a lot of times people would say things to me like, oh, be comforted. Your father is looking down on you from heaven or he's right there with you, you know, by your side and things like that. And as nice and as kind as those things were, they simply were not the truth. And if anybody knows anything about me, I am a lover of truth. Um, I'm not one of those people that loves to hear things just because it sounds good. I want to know what actually is true and I want to know what exactly the 
Bible says about what happens when people die. And so I know I can be a bit long winded in these videos. And at first I was like, man, I feel kind of bad about that. You know, people got to sit there and listen to this whole thing. But, you know, I've just kind of decided it is what it is. This is a very sensitive and touchy subject to talk about. And I want to make sure by the end of this video, you're absolutely clear about what scripture says about what happens when you die. Now, some people, I can give the scripture word for word and they're still not gonna accept it. I actually have a minister, a um, friend of mine that I've kind of given this Bible study to and he said, I can see clearly what the scripture says. The scripture is saying what you say. However, I just wanna believe what I've been believing because I'm comfortable with that. You know, I, I personally don't understand that. Um, for Christians, we're supposed to follow what the Bible says. So that's what I'm going to go by today. Okay, so let's begin. So um, I'm going to do this in kind of like a question answer format. The way I learned it, that's how I learned it. It was in questions and answers and with biblical answers. And so that's how I'm going to do this one so that I can stay on target. Now, first question is, how did we get here in the first place? And I have to say, what surprises me a lot about people, so many people don't really think about that. From the time I was a little girl, I would just like look at myself in the mirror, I would just sit back and think like, who am I? How did I get here? Who made me? It, it baffled my mind. So as I got older and was able to actually seek that out, um, I, I went to find out and there's answers to that out there. So it does surprise me sometimes when people they live their life every day and they don't question where did I come from, where I'm going, who made me. So my hope in these videos is that maybe for some people who didn't even really think about it, maybe this will spark some curiosity in you and maybe it'll spark you to, to search and to find that out. So how did we get here? So we're going to look at Genesis 2, um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And just to let you know, I'm using um, a King James version of the Bible. I mean, I use that because usually there's not any conflict over that. If you use some of these other translations or paraphrases, some people have, you know, issue with that. But King James Version, pretty much most people, you know, ex can accept that. So in Genesis 2, 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Okay, so what is that saying? Dust of the ground, breath from God into the nostrils, man became a living soul. Okay, so that's where we came from. Now, what happens when a person dies? Okay, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit, that breath, will return to the God that gave it. Okay? I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that later on. Now, what is the spirit that returns to God at death? Okay, so James chapter 2 verse 27 says, The body without the spirit is dead. So whatever the spirit is, if our physical bodies don't have it, then we die. We're dead. The in Job 27, chapter 27, verse 3, it says, The Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So what's in your nostrils? The Spirit that returns to God at death is the breath of life. Nowhere in all of the Bible does the Spirit have any life, wisdom, or feeling after a person dies. It is the breath of life and nothing more. Okay. So now we're going to talk about what a soul is. Now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 again. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's that spirit we just talked about. And man became a living soul. When those two things came together, man became a living soul. So what's a soul? Do we possess a soul? According to scripture, a soul is a living being. The combination of the dust of the earth and the, um, 
and the breath of life that's breathed into our nostrils. Now, a soul cannot exist unless the body, the body and the breath are combined, okay? Now, God's word teaches us that we are souls. So similar to when you hear people say, you know, back in the day when there was, um, you know, a, a ship sank or something like that, you remember like the Titanic and they said, you know, 500 souls were lost. And what they're saying was 500 people, souls, okay? Now, next question, do souls die, okay? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, again, King James Version says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, every living soul died in the sea, and that's in Revelation 16, 3, talking about people. Now, according to God's word, souls do die. We are souls and souls die. And I'm making this I'm probably talking really slow and making it very clear because I'm going to get into some heavier points later on. So I want this to be crystal clear before we get to the more difficult stuff. Now, only God has an immortal soul. You hear a lot of people say that we have immortal souls. But we just read here that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So the concept of an undying, immortal soul goes against what the Bible says, which teaches that souls are, in fact, subject to death. Now, now, we're in a, now, now that we kind of have like the, the ABCs, the one, two, threes of what a soul is and these different things, we're going to get a little bit heavier. Now, do good people go to heaven when they die? The concept that we see in the world today, and we see it in the movies and, and, different, and in books and things like that, says that if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. And that's what we think. As soon as we die, we go to heaven or we go to hell. And that's why people said to me, your dad is looking down on you because my, they felt that my dad was a good man, you know, a good and righteous man. So as soon as he died, he must have went to heaven. So that's why he's looking down on me. But we want to find out, is that really where my dad is? Now, in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, it says, All who are in the graves will hear his voice, the voice of Christ, and come forth. Now, in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, it says, David is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Okay, so we know that the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. So most of us can agree that more than likely King David is going to be in heaven. But it says clearly here in Scripture that David is both dead both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So if anyone's going to be in heaven, we know it's going to be King David, but he's both dead and buried. Okay, now Job, um, Job chapter 17 verse 13 says, If I wait, the grave is mine house. So to answer the question, do good people go to heaven when they die? David was supposed to be a good, a good person. He's not in heaven. He's both dead and buried. Okay. What happens when a good person or a bad person dies, they go to their graves and await the resurrection day. And we're going to get into that a little bit more later. Now, next question. How much does one know or comprehend after death? So going back to the thing, the, the statement that said to me, your father is watching you from heaven. He's comforting you. He's with you. So how much does my father know now that he has passed away? How much does he comprehend? Well, let's find out what the Bible says. So it says, for the living know that they will die. We're the living. We know that we're going to die. But listen to this and listen very carefully. But the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love, their hatred, 
and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. There is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 and verses 10, 6 and 10. The dead do not praise the Lord. That's in Psalms 115, verse 17. Now we know when we get to heaven that there is going to be lots of praising and shouting of our Lord because we finally arrived. But here in Psalms it says, the dead do not praise the Lord. So to sum that up, it says, God says that the dead know absolutely nothing. That's what scripture says. So if the dead know not nothing and my father has passed away and he's part of the dead, how can he be with me and comforting me if scripture clearly states that he does not know nothing? Okay. And I know for a lot of you have been taught your whole life that, you know, your loved ones are watching down, they're in heaven, they're with you. That's hard to swallow. And I understand, but we're going to keep going. And I suggest if what I'm saying is difficult to swallow, while I'm doing this, get a piece of paper, get a pencil and your Bible, write down these scriptures and look up what it says. Don't take my word for it. Look up the scriptures and read them for yourselves. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no parts and excuse me, no share in anything under the sun. Okay, we're going to move on. Now it says, but here's the next question. But can't the dead communicate with the living? And aren't they aware of what the living are doing? Okay, so we're going to read Job chapter 14, verses 12 and verses 21. Okay, so man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. His sons come to honor and he does not know it. They are brought low and he does not perceive it. What does that mean? Okay, I know the language of King James can be difficult. His sons come to honor. When my father passed, he is was put in a, excuse me, he was put in um. Fortunately, I can't think of the word right now, but it's kind of like a crypt. He was not buried in the ground. He was put in a casket and he was put into like um, one of those memorials, but not buried. And so um, I have a hard time going to his the site, but my mother, that's very important to her. She likes to go there and her doing that is kind of like what the scripture says. She's honoring him. So when his sons come to honor when my dad, when we as his children or his wife come to honor him and his, his death, the Bible says he does not know it. He does not know that we're there, you know, grieving on him. It says when they are brought low, when we're there at his uh, grave site grieving him and are brought low, he does not perceive it. My dad does not know that that's, that that's what we're doing. And I'm going to repeat this one again in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 6. Write that down. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. So the answer to can't the dead communicate with the living or according to scripture? No, the dead cannot contact the living, nor do they know what the living are doing. They are in fact dead. Okay, we're going to move on. Okay, now. Um, I always say this in my videos, but I am a Seventh-day Adventist. And um, when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, a lot of people called us a cult. And so I was a little skeptical of that because I'm like, oh, they're a cult? And one of the reasons that we are called a cult is because people say that we believe in soul sleep and that is a, a devilish false doctrine. So... And it, it sounds like soul sleep. That sounds kind of funny. That doesn't sound, you know, biblical. You know, it does sound a little bit cultish. cultish. So I really looked into that. So let's find out what Jesus calls death. And so the question is, Jesus called the unconscious state of the dead sleep in John 11, um, John chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. So... 
how long will they sleep? That's the question. So let's, let's read about that. Job chapter 14, verse 12. So man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. Now. Okay, excuse me. Sometimes I pause because my kids come down. Um, so please excuse me for that. So um, we were talking about how um, Jesus himself calls death sleep. So pay very close attention to this. Matter of fact, I would really write these scriptures down. So we're going to go to the book of John, chapter 11, verse 39. And Jesus said, Take you away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, the dead being a man by the name of Lazarus, saith unto him, Lord, by the time by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Now, let's pause there for a minute. A lot of you have probably heard these testimonies and these things of people that say that they've had a near-death experience and they were on the operating table, the, the doctors pronounced them dead they were dead and they saw a great light and a voice telling them to go towards the light. And there are so many different studies about those things. Um, some people say there's still a certain amount of, you know, carbon dioxide in their brain. There, there's, there's still, you know, something going on in their brain. They're having basically a hallucination when that happens. To be honest with you, I don't know what's going on in their brain when they've been pronounced dead for a few seconds even for a couple of minutes. But remember, we're Christians. We believe scripture, what scripture says. In this case, Lazarus had been dead four days. This was not a near-death experience. He had been dead four days. And Martha, his sister, told Jesus, don't pull back this, this stone because his body is already starting to decompose. Remember what we talked about earlier? When a person dies, what happens? Remember the dust of the ground, um, the, um, the breath of life come together to form a living soul. When we die, that separates. The body goes back to dust and the breath goes back to the one that gave it. So in this case, when she says he stink stinketh, Lazarus' body is starting to decompose. And if we were to put a body in, we put we embalm a body and we preserve it and we put in this, cost, this casket, seal it tight, to, to, I guess to, to postpone this from happening, but you're going to de decompose. If you were put into the ground, that's exactly what you're going to return to. You're going to return to earth. So in this case, four days, completely dead, starting to stink. Now let's see, we're going to go to John chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 11, and we're going to see where Jesus says that Lazarus sleep. So here we go. It says, these things said he, and after that, he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, this is a red letter version. So when he says, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, those are the words of Jesus Christ himself. He's saying that Lazarus sleepeth. So some people say, well, he's saying that Lazarus sleepeth, but that's not really what he meant. He wasn't really saying that. Let's find out what Jesus really meant when he said that Lazarus sleepeth. Okay, so we're going to go down to verse 12. And it says, Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. He's just taking a nap. That's what Jesus meant, right? So how be it? Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus to them, plainly and this is what scripture says verse 14 write that down then jesus then said jesus unto them plainly lazarus is dead and i am glad for your sakes that i was not there to the intent you may believe nevertheless let us go to him okay that's very clear jesus said that lazarus sleepeth and then in verse 14, he clears it up for his disciples because they thought too, like many people believe that Jesus is saying that he was asleep. But he made it very clear in red letters that Lazarus is dead. 
Okay, so we've made it you know, crystal clear that Jesus calls death asleep and that the dead are there, are in fact dead and they have no parts of anything under the sun. We've made all of that crystal clear. So the question, we know that their bodies have gone back to the ground and um, their spirits have gone, which is the breath of God, has gone back to God, the one that has given it to them, that they're no longer living soul, those things have been separated. So we know that. So what happens then? So the next question, what happens to the righteous dead at the second coming of Christ? And for this, we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And we're going to find out what's going to happen to all these people that have died. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. I'm going to read it straight out of the King James Bible so that we understand clear. So it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, so it says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, a lot of you have heard about this second coming of Christ. God, Christ is gonna come again. He's gonna return and he's gonna save us. And so let's really think about this. If my father right now is in heaven and we know heaven to be this beautiful, wonderful place where there's no more tears, there's no more pain, suffering, dying, any of that stuff. So basically what happens is when Christ returns to earth, they're snatched up out of heaven and they're put back in the grave for verse 16 to happen, for the dead in Christ to rise first. Does that really make sense for them to come out of heaven, go back into the ground so that then they can rise? It absolutely doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is what the Bible says. The dead in Christ, the ones that have died, will rise first. So if they rise first, that there, then there must be a second resurrection. And unfortunately, that is another um, Bible lesson that I'm going to do. Um, about the second coming of Christ. But if the dead in Christ rise first, then the second resurrection are the dead not in Christ. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and give you that scripture because I don't want to leave you hanging and then we'll move on. So hold on. Okay, so um, since I don't want to leave you hanging, I'm just going to touch on what happens to the wicked that um, did not rise um, at the brightness of Christ, um, at at Christ's second coming. So we're going to, for that, we're going to go to Revelations chapter 20 and verses 4b, the second part of verse 4 and then into verse 5. Okay, so here we go. It says, um, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, okay? So obviously the ones that didn't um, have the mark, that um, did not worship the beast, obviously those are the saints, the righteous. So at the brightness of his coming, um, the, the dead in Christ rise first. The ones that are living at that time that are also righteous, um, they're caught up with Christ in the air. Now, the ones that did not um, serve Christ or follow Christ that took the mark of the beast. Um, verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead, the ones that um, did worship the beast, did take the mark, the unrighteous that um, were dead, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So all those righteous people that were living or dead get caught up with Christ and they reign with Christ for 1,000 years. And when that 1,000 years have finished, um, the rest of the dead um, do not live again until that 1,000 years was finished. And the Bible says this is the first resurrection. So 
the dead and living in Christ, part of the first resurrection. The second resurrection is are going to be those that were um, dead who were not in Christ. Okay, like I said, that's another topic that can take a while to break down. But Revelation chapter 20, I would read that chapter, go over that. And then also those verses I gave you in um, 1 Thessalonians um, chapter 4. Read that too and I'll give you a little bit more information on Christ's second, um, Christ's second coming. So, now, we want, here's the question that we want to ask. We're going to get a little bit deeper here. Now, what was the devil's very first lie on earth? And to find that out, and that's very important, the first time you ever lie, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, okay? And it says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. That was the very first line that, very first lie that Satan told Eve. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan. That's in Revelation 12, 9, so that we know when we said this, what the serpent said to the woman, that's who we're talking about. We're talking about Satan, the devil. So his first lie, that you will not die. And some, some people are like, well, he didn't lie because Eve didn't die. Well, she didn't die at that moment. No, she did not. But is Eve dead? She absolutely is dead. Okay, so the question is, why did the devil lie to Eve about death? And could the subject of death be more important than what we think? You know, why is it so important um, what we believe about what happens to the dead? Okay, one of the most important parts of the devil's teachings is this subject of death. We know that Satan, the devil, always uses deception and God always wants the truth. So throughout the ages, Satan has been able to work very powerful miracles to deceive people through ones that claim to receive power from the spirits of the dead, okay? So we know in the Bible, we have the magicians that were in Egypt. We have the witch of um, the witch of Endor, that's in 1 Samuel. There's lots of uh, sorcerers. Then there's the certain slave girl that, um, that was talked about in the book of Acts. And through these sorcerers, these magicians, wizards, witches, who claim to speak to the dead, many people were deceived. We know that in the end time, Satan again is going to use sorcery, trickery, as he did in Daniel's day to deceive the world, okay? Um, sorcery, if you don't know what that is, it is a supernatural, I'm reading a definition, agency that claims to receive its power and wisdom from the spirits of the dead. So if you do not fully understand what truly happens with a person dies when someone, a spiritist, a psychic, these different people come to you and they can give you these readings and different things. You are now under that person's influence and you can be deceived because you're opened up to what they're saying because you believe that they're actually communicating with the dead. Now, a lot of the times um, these sorcerers, um, these, these soothsayers and, you know, palm readers and all these people, um, they say very truthful things. And people say, hey, I went to a, a palm reader and she read my fortune and, and, and this really happened or, or this person said that they were speaking and to my loved one and this person knew all this information about my loved one. How could they possibly know that unless they were really speaking to them? But we know that there are demonic spirits that are in and among us that we cannot see. Okay, so if this palm reader, you know, person, um, they actually believe a lot of the times they're deceived too. They really believe that they're speaking to a dead person. A lot of the time, the only thing that they're speaking to are demonic spirits. And because these demonic spirits are all around us, they're in our lives, they know our lives, they know our loved ones, they're able to give these um, fortune tellers and things information about your loved ones that a lot of times no one else 
would really know. And if you do not understand the scripture behind this and behind what these demonic spirits are doing, you will absolutely be deceived. So basically what these, these demonic spirits do is they like to pose as our, um, our godly loved ones that we know were Christian. They pose as them. They um, pose as, as clergymen um, that are dead, Bible prophets, um, and even sometimes we see that they pose as apostles or disciples of Christ. And we see that in, um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 13. You can read about um, them doing that. But we know that Satan and his angels will deceive billions of people. So for those people in any form, um, will absolutely be one of the ones that are deceived. Okay, so let's talk about this deception, okay? And we know that as we come near and nearer to the end times and Christ's second coming, we know there is going to be a lot of deception and there is a lot of um, deception going on right now. So the question we wanna ask is, do devils really work miracles? Are they able to work miracles? Let's find out what the Bible says. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 14, it says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the very elect so who are the very elect these are people who these are our pastors ministers evangelists all these people who seem to have so much wisdom and understanding the Bible says even those ones are going to be deceived by Satan and his um, Satan and his devils. So the question might be asked, you know, if demonic spirits are able to work miracles, they're able to pose as dead loved ones, you have false prophets, false pastors, false preachers, how can I not be deceived? How can I be one of the ones that takes part in the first resurrection? Well, the Bible gives you that answer. And it says in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, write that one down too. It says, they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things are so. Now in Isaiah chapter eight, verse 20, it also says, if they do not speak, According to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So basically what the scripture is saying that to keep from being deceived and 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 to, to, to know the truth and know what's going on, you're going to have to read this word. There's no way around it because the deception is so deep. If you just listen, you've been going to your pastor for 20, 30 years. And like I said, I told you about my friend before and he's been under his pastor for many many years literally this is how deep this he's a minister at his church and this is how deep the deception is even given scripture about the bible his mind cannot accept it because he's been under that deception for so long the things i told you about the dead and what christ says about the dead right out of scripture and i know that there's many of you watching this that even listening to what I said, you can look at the scriptures all you want to, it's still going to be that hard for you to, to receive it. Because like it says, if possible, um, even the very elect will be deceived. Okay, now, like we just said in Acts there, those that are not um, deceived, will they receive the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So is it just about just reading the scriptures? I gave you all those scriptures and, and you heard them, you can hear them, but it's about receiving the word with all readiness, meaning that you wanna know. I remember when I was researching this topic, I really wanted to know what the Bible said. I could have cared less what any pastor or someone said, that's just something we can concoct anything in our mind about what we want to believe what happens to the dead. We miss our loved ones. I miss my father so much. If I can just have one more moment with that man, it's like I would give anything for it. And so I absolutely can understand a person really wanting to believe that their person is right next to them in their house or is looking down on them or comes to visit them. I understand wanting, wanting that. I would love if my father 
could visit me. But the fact of the, the, of the matter, the, the truth, the reality of it is that my father is just that. He's dead. And he's not looking down on me. And he's not coming to visit me. And that is a very hard thing to swallow. And please don't feel that I'm being insensitive to that. I'm not because literally I'm still in mourning. It's not even been a quite a year yet since my father has passed. So I'm still feeling this every day. I miss that man with all my heart. But because I'm, I'm sad and in mourning, do I throw away the truth of God's word? Absolutely not. Okay, so we're coming to a close here. So for some of you out there who have held so strong to your beliefs, I know what I said is hard to swallow and some of you absolutely won't, won't accept it won't, and, and, and will reject it. I understand that. But there's good news in that. And even though my father is gone and I can't talk to him and I can't touch him and I can't, you know, I, I, I can't pick up the phone and call him anymore, there's some good news. And that's why God's word is awesome. And here's the last question. Will the righteous people who are raised in the resurrection ever die again? And the answer to that is no. Um, we're going to look at Luke chapter 20, verses 35 and 36, and it says this. It says, But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead, nor can they die anymore. And this right here, I have so many favorite scriptures in the Bible, but this one right here, this is a go-to for almost anything that I'm going through and in mourning and dealing with the, the passing of my father this one I think got me through some some terrible terrible times and it's Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 write this one down and it says and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for, my, for the former things have passed away and that's God's promise to us um, death sorrow crying tragedy will never again enter into God's new kingdom so as the Bible says when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory and that's in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verse 54 so do I miss my father <laughs> absolutely but my hope what I put my hope and my faith in is in what God's Word says that although my father is dead and gone and he does not know what's going on with me and I can't speak to him I know that if I keep going on in my faith and if I keep pushing forward and 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 run this race as the Bible says it seems like more of a marathon but I think it's gonna seem like it was just a race I know that I'm gonna see my father again and um, towards the last few years of my dad's um, life he was on a, a major spiritual journey himself and he was seeking out truth and he also was learning about the doctrines of the seventh day Adventist and he understood this doctrine and before he passed me my dad had lots of really deep conversations that's that's what me and him did we just would get into it and get into scripture and so before he died while he was going through um, his cancer treatments we had a conversation I asked him I said dad do you know what's gonna happen you know when you pass because we knew that it was coming and he absolutely knew you know and he took comfort in that he knew where he was going and when I die I know where I'm going I know what's going to happen it's not a mystery to me and I'm not confused and what I know is that even though I can't be with him right now, that that day is gonna come where I'm gonna be reunited with my father again. I go, I'm not gonna say just me, but all of us go through so much pain and heartache in this life. The, you know, the racism, you know, murder, discrimination, you know, dealing with death, financial problems, the struggles, depression, the, the sickness, disease, all, you know, we don't really deal with it in the United States so much, well, some do, but you have famine going on in other countries, genocide. This place, even though that there are some, some pleasures, this place that we're in is a horrible place. And 
God is not so evil that he will have people in heaven looking down at the pain that we are going through here. My dad does not did not have to look at me and my sisters and my mom on the day of his funeral mourning and crying for him because we cried. Um, he didn't have to look at that. My dad's at rest. He doesn't know anything that's going on in his life right now. His next conscious thought is going to be being re resurrected with his Savior and being reunited with his family. And our God's a good God. And that's and that's the system that he set up, set up and it makes absolute sense. So um, I think that's pretty much the end of this Bible study. I do understand that this was long, but... Honestly, it could have been way longer than, than this. I, I kind of just gave the basics of this doctrine and what happens to us um, when we die. So my hope is for anyone that was able to sit through this and listen, please, um, in the comment section, ask questions. Um, I love doing this and I love putting that information and knowledge out there. If you disagree, put it down there too and I'm gonna do my best to answer those questions um, for you. Um, so that's very, that's pretty much it. Again, peace and blessings and thank you for listening. Oh, and the sun's almost setting, so happy Sabbath.